Welcome to the Liberty Insider. This is your program uh, where you can share with us some of the recent developments on religious liberty. We'll analyze the issues and discuss the value of religious liberty in the modern era. My name is Lincoln Steed, editor of Liberty Magazine, and my guest on the program is uh, Ed Cook, Dr. Ed Cook, uh, with a doctorate in church state studies uh, and a few articles in Liberty under your belt and quite a few speaking appointments uh, uh, behind you. So uh, let, let's, let's share something about religious liberty, uh, but take it from a funny angle, money. All right. <laughs> Hello, uh, whether it's religion or, or crime or politics, they often say, follow the money and yeah, uh, that's true. you'll come at it. And uh, in the last few months, there's been a lot of discussion in the US about a new tax bill. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know why there's such eternal optimism on this, because if you study any history in the US or England or Western countries, whenever the tax issues came up, it means more tax, not less. <laughs> <laughs> or probably more accurately in the US, more debt. So there's no free lunch. Uh, but I noticed that buried in the, the tax bill uh, was the, the uh, repudiation of what was once buried in a tax bill back in the 50s called the Johnson Amendment. Yes. Got any thoughts on the Johnson Amendment? Well, we do know that uh, in the historical context, that had been uh, part of the tax bill then because the candidates uh, running for office felt that religious groups were having too much undue influence in the political realm. And so as a means of basically curtailing that, uh, the Johnson Amendment in essence establishes, uh, once it was passed, in essence uh, prohibits religious entities from endorsing and any particular... And non-profits. Yes. To, to be fair to it, it isn't just taking a shot at re religious groups, but they clearly uh, were a major target. And it, and it was because certain religious groups had opposed the re-election of, uh, of Johnson. Correct. Of Johnson. So it was a bit of payback. Uh, and, and we're caught with a, with a conundrum, a quandary because of this. Uh, we do want a separation of church and state. I do think, and I think you agree, it's, it's not healthy for churches to become directly involved in politics and fundraising mm -hmm. and all the, hebel, uh, you know, the scrabble of, uh, of political rivalries. But it's also not good for the churches to be prohibited from having a public voice. Expression, yes. Uh, so it's, it's a problem. And, and President Trump, uh, with his alliance, uh, rather historic alliance with the uh, religious right, by my lights, the last time I remember such an alliance was when Jimmy Carter was elected. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, he was a legitimately religious figure of sorts, uh, where this is an alliance of expediency on both counts, I think. Uh, but, but the president now has, has made it very plain that he intends to, to uh, uh, overturn uh, the Johnson Amendment, but I've been watching it and I noticed that it was added quietly to the tax bill, which is not yet, as we uh, sit here now, been passed, probably will in some form or another, but in its present form, it suddenly was taken off mm -hmm. just the last couple of days, uh, which is interesting, but I don't think that's the end of the game. I think one way or another, it's going to be uh, uh, undone maybe just by an executive order. Well, let, let me ask you this, Lincoln. Um, you know, on my end, I, I was not aware of the most recent kind of uh, development where originally it had been introduced and now it has been taken out of the current tax bill. I just bill, heard it on the news <clears throat> within 24 hours. So let me uh, kind of throw this out there. How, wh what would you envision kind of the development? Let's just say that hypothetically, if the Johnson Amendment were repealed, um, what would you see developing? With religious groups and yes, yes, the the outcome of it. I think a medieval model where the churches become uh, direct political players, like Cardinal Richelieu in France. <laughs> How does that strike you? 
Well, uh, I do know historically, uh, I was just, uh, your th comment uh, jogged my, my memory that in Mexico, uh, one of the, I guess one can say ever since the 1850s, there has been a church-state struggle that has been going on in Mexico uh, that for a period of time uh, they ousted Catholicism and did not allow the priests to have direct influence. Uh, they weren't allowed to vote. Uh, and then that led to the Christiata uh, back in the 1920s where actually Catholic priests began to, uh, they would not allow Catholic members that had had loved ones who died, they weren't allowed to bury them, they did not perform the mass, they did not perform marriage. Well, in essence, uh, they shut down any religious and, and, service and, uh, uh, because they felt like they were being ostracized. And priests who were from Spain were, were sent out. Correct. Ejected out of the country and other priests were uh, even physically harmed. It, it was a serious uh, push. Yes, and, and priests, uh, were, priests were not allowed uh, during that time period, not allowed to... wear to their vestments outside the church. Yes, and, and also not allowed to have any kind of role in politics. Uh, so as a response to that, the church basically shut down its services uh, to make a statement. And eventually, uh, the priest organized the people to protest against the government for that reason. And then yeah. in the 1930s, uh, afterwards, uh, for about two decades, uh, there was kind of a resurgence of Catholicism and then a wane. And uh, during the yeah. time period of Vicente Fox, uh, the church actually had more of a resurgence. It was, he gave them favors in essence. So and kind throughout of Latin America, that's where the Roman Catholics ended up, churches ended up. They're not the sole uh, religious political power but they're the first among equals. They get yes. preferential treatment, but other religions uh, are, are allowed to be players too. But, but now, uh, what I think will happen if the Johnson Amendment is repudiated, uh, it's not really quite along the, the lines of, of Mexico, which of course morphed into that from a medieval model. I mean, the Inquisition, by the, after all, continued the longest in Latin America than in Europe. Mm. Uh, so it was heavy handedness and, and this was a reaction to the heavy handedness of a monolithic church. But what I believe will, will happen is something analogous to, uh, uh, to Italy. You know, in Italy they have parties, Christian Democrats say. Uh, there are parties that their whole uh, uh, identity and agenda is religious. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a few decades now since uh, um, Pat Robertson ran for president. But you know, with the Johnson Amendment gone, you could have a, a religious right faction made up of a coalition of, of uh, evangelical pastors raise their own funds, have their own power base, their own constituency base, and put forward a presidential candidate. So it would be the religious party, a particular mm -hmm. religious party. Mm -hmm. Now that, uh, your comment there about a faction kind of jogs my memory. Uh, James Madison. They were against uh, factionalism. Yeah, in in uh, what it's was it, number 51, uh, yeah. if what he wrote, you know, in the, um, the <clears throat> letters that he wrote on those topics, uh, where he talked about the idea of the... By the way, they were against political parties too. Yes. They didn't like the Whigs and the Tories in, in uh, England. Yeah, it wasn't just religious. And, but right, and never expected the, the, the uh, multi-party set up here. They, when, when George Washington was made president, there was no party. Mm. There were people that ran for office. Mm -hmm. Correct. Uh, so what Madison was stating is that by not allowing any one faction to gain that kind of influence in a state or throughout the country, it would help uh, prevent any predominant group taking control over the country or undoing the Constitution, etc. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think that there was wisdom uh, in what he argued for. Uh, how that plays out in practical terms, of course, is something that it uh, kind of depends on circumstances and yeah. historical time period, you know. And, and, you know, I have a, not a different take, but a, a, a take on this whole Johnson Amendment colored by uh, an article that, that we had in Liberty Magazine. And time goes by, but at least 10 years ago, uh, uh, by D. James Kennedy, mm. who used to be very well known in the United States. He was one of the major television evangelists. Uh, he had a ministry out of Coral Gables. Uh, I, th I think he was, uh, what's the, the, the Sc Scottish uh, uh, church, not Presbyterianism? Episcopalian? No. Maybe it is Presbyterian, Presbyterian uh, pastor. Uh, but he used to give his sermons very, he was a very engaging speaker, but not arms waving and all right. It's very dignified, always wore his robes. <laughs> and uh, 
you know, he had a, a large following, but he had come out very publicly as a, in a political way, pushing for what was called then the Jones Bill. And uh, I, I, I had him write an article for Liberty, of course, in favor of the Jones Bill, and then I wrote a long uh, uh, editorial note underneath it saying why we were against it. And I told him I'd do it, you know, I didn't do anything unfair. I wanted to give him a, a forum to discuss it, but I wasn't going to endorse it. Uh, because I think it's very dangerous. But his view was that the churches need to have a voice. They need to be unbound. <laughs> and with the Jones Amendment, there would have been a lot. This was, remember, at the time when uh, uh, the McCain-Feingold campaign reform thing came along, which has been broken now by these CPAC things that can short-circuit the whole thing. But the desire was to limit monies involved in the political process and factionalism. Uh, and the Jones Bill would have allowed them to raise unlimited monies for candidates and parties, give them unlimited fora uh, uh, up front of the churches, and basically the church easily could become a, a, an even more dominant political power than the parties themselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't see how American democracy would remain uh, anything like it is today with that sort of a dynamic. And it, so and let, it me, let me ask you this. Got defeated. So that's what lies behind the repudiation of the Johnson Amendment, which in itself is fairly innocuous, produces a good result, but it might be overreach in, in putting it in place. But we know what they really want. It's not uh, a lack of a heavy hand of the government. It's control of the whole process. So let me ask you this, um, just on a kind of a comparative basis, right? Uh, the current context of, one would say, political expression in the pulpit uh, compared to the time period when uh, we were the, in the co colonial era, moving into na nationhood, right, nationhood, uh, where you had pulpits of where there was political expression that was given to rally the, the citizens, the colonists, uh, in the overthrow of Britain. Um, right. So, kind of, uh, what would you, what would be your take on I that? I don't think that was uh, nothing co of comparison good for or? the church. I mean, if you, if you're just looking narrowly at the, at the success of the American Revolution, probably wouldn't have proceeded as well without the, the, the uh, what did they call them, the, uh, the, the, the Black Robe Regiment, mm. uh, the, the pro separationist uh, pastors. But remember the obverse is that most people belong to the Church of England mm -hmm. and by and large the Church of England was supporting the role of the crown and it's no accident that to this day you don't call it the Church of England in the US. It became unpopular uh, and it was seen as the old world and we didn't want loyalties to England so they called it Episcopal. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so on that side it was bad. They were so identified with, with England that, that uh, that it went badly for them. And I, and I think, yes, the outcome of the War of Independence might have been good, but that was a moment when, when preachers were greatly politicized and, and it didn't help the spirituality that they should have been uh, performing. So looking Spiritual at it uh, historically then, would you, you might say that um, in the current context, you know, there's no revolution in essence that, that is occurring uh, as far as like th or throwing off the yoke of a foreign power. No. Um, this is purely a desire for more power by uh, the so-called religious right, which has been around at the very least since the 70s mm -hmm. and has had ups and downs. Uh, and, and they want a larger role. And, and there's many things playing into it, increasing secularization, the abortion debate frustrated them. And of course they were co-opted by Roman Catholicism. As you know, mm -hmm. uh, the reason Roman ca Catholics are against abortion is far deeper than the Protestant one. It's original sin. <laughs> all sorts of goodies. Uh, but that and, and the, the homosexual uh, movement, the feminism, all an offense to, and correctly so, to people of a true religious sensibility. But when you want to change it and think that you can change it back to the holy nation, you want political power to do so. Mm -hmm. and, and I think the, the, oh, and, the, and also what's frustrating them is the rise of Islamic fundamentalism along with a, a, a rising fundamental, or not fundamentalist, but a, a rising Islamic presence, mm -hmm. which is a, another cultural religious identity, which, you know, it's slipping away. So it's the lost cause. Let's, let's reclaim America. Well, mm -hmm. make America great again. Uh, we'll be back after a short break. So stay with us and we'll continue this discussion.
Welcome back to the Liberty Insider. Before the break, uh, we were really into some some <laughs> some heavy talking. Yeah, uh, and, with, and, and uh, I think I cut you off a bit. No, you know, actually, um, uh, you did a very concise uh, summary looking at the because I, I posed to you the question dealing with historical context of political sermons during right. the American Revolution, as opposed to the idea nowadays of churches that want to make ex public or political expressions in the pulpit. And there are some historical distinct differences, obviously. Um, and at the same time, it's something that is uh, undergoing well, religion debate. Is, is the further back in history you go, the, the more powerful the role of religion was in, in determining public events. But even in our day, like we have a, um, an article in an upcoming issue of Liberty Magazine, and, and the illustration is powerful. It's, it's a painting of Cardinal Spellman with a B-52 in his hands, as I remember. And it tells the story in the Vietnam War where he uh, was dedicating the bombers as they were going off to fight the Vietnam War. And you could make a pretty good case that the war might not have gone as, on as long if, if uh, uh, th these major religious figures like Spillman hadn't thrown their weight behind it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, before the, the War of Independence, uh, there was the Civil War in England, uh, which was precipitated, well, by uh, two things. Nominally, the king wanted money to wage a foreign war. But the, the uh, uh, aggravation at the time was that the, the Archbishop of Canterbury, who was accused of being a high churchman and favoring Rome anyway, he brought in a new book of common prayer. And the agitation was so great that it fired up the, the Protestants, the, the uh, Puritans particularly, uh, to go on the war path. And they saw the king as representing Catholic interests. It's a religious war. Uh, uh, so, how is that different from today? You've got secularists, you've got uh, signs of immorality that bother Christians and they want to recapture. So there's a religious dynamic. Mm -hmm. and, and you mentioned the role of the ministers in the War of Independence. Of course, religion was there front and center. Uh, some of it was unavoidable because religious, religion meant so much for them. But when the, the, the black-robed regiment <laughs> of the revolutionary pastors stood out and, and argued for separation from England. They became political operatives. And, and when the Church of England uh, preachers urged people to remain loyal to the crown, they were government auxiliaries. There's just no getting around that. So based on that, uh, one would kind of ask the question, right, why um, you're cur in the current context, religious groups that are seeking political expression in the pulpit uh, what might be their motivation for that? I mean, based on the historical well, information you've outlined, right? Let um, me ask you a question uh, again. What should there be their motivation? <laughs> Not what might have been. Shouldn't the motivation of a pastor standing before a, 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 a congregation be to spread spirituality and, 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 and a knowledge of the divine mm -hmm. and lead you to godliness? Yes, you know, I think that that's the very essence of uh, right. Christianity. Do you think that's what they want with, with the, the repudiation of the Johnston Amendment? Well, it would seem to. I mean, the, kind of the, the obvious, right, is that if they see the Johnson Amendment as a prohibition of their political expression and political aspirations, then the removal of that is that, you know, their well, intentions... Well, in a way, you didn't answer my question. Mm. You, you turned it instantly to politics. But my point is the legitimate role of a pastor is, yes, to, to uh, relate modern concerns in, in a spiritual context. So you can't easily preach a sermon that's dismissive of the prevailing immorality or of the injustice that the government might be perpetrating. That can bear on it, but you're spreading spiritual truth and biblical uh, reference points and godliness and san sanctification and all those things, right? So if that pastor with that role wants political power, is it to enlarge that sort of message or is it just to have power to either force people to think as he thinks or to listen to him uh, against their will? Because I, I'm, I'm particularly convinced that a litmus test of religious liberty is, is there coercion involved? Mm -hmm. Well, that, that certainly is true. I mean, true. that's the yeah. end of the whole game. And, and you might not think it's coercion, but a secular person might think if they are now on, on their dollar 
uh, where they contribute to the public good through taxes or whatever, they're now going to have a, 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 be forced to either listen to the pastor or even be co-opted to some of his political adventures through his direct uh, activity as a political leader. Mm. I mean, that's, that's an abusive use of religion in my view. Mm -hmm. But it fits into a grand old model of, of behavior going back into the Middle Ages. It's yeah. regressive. I just do not see uh, uh, any good need for this. There might be a little arguable need if we were under persecution. Then you might want to get into the king's palace and, and whisper in his ear as a figurative thing to political power to uh, ease the persecution on the faithful. But that's not the case. We're wanting the right to, uh, to uh, mandate political actions, to order the civil sphere. It's crossing the line mm -hmm. of separation of church and state in an egregious way, or an intention to do it. Mm -hmm. I was going to mention that uh, it's interesting, as you point that out, that uh, one of the 16 documents that was pronounced by the Catholic Church at Vatican II was addressing the role of the church in society. And in essence, what the, the document argues is that Catholics have the, not only the obligation before God, but also the church encouraging them to, as faithful citizens, to evangelize and Christianize society, in essence. Well, I think uh, they do. I think that's a good statement. Uh, but, but from the perspective of, in essence, it, it's more but of a shift from the church saying, we're going to take a de definitive dominant political role as an institution, and instead we're going to ask now the members yeah. to go out and, and perform that role. So, right. you know, in that regard... I mean, uh, the Bible calls that your, your, your salt. Mm -hmm. you, you're a, a, an agent for change in society. Yeah. That's what all uh, uh, churches should be on about, and it's indeed what all political action groups are on about. They want to s start cell movements and, and change society. I mean, it's only the dictators, dictator dictatorship mindset that wants to uh, sit on the throne and, you know, bam, zap, zap, you do this. Uh, but I let, think let that's a very this, natural let, let, uh, let, approach. Let, let me ask you this kind of at the core of, of the, the whole kind of issue, it seems to be, is that if religious groups of whatever persuasion are motivated by the right, uh, how would I call it, the positive motivation to share their faith, uh, wouldn't that seem that seem to be the, sufficient to gain more adherence and make change in society rather than trying to legislate it? Well, I, Is that know, right? I agree, absolutely. Okay. That's how I see it. Yeah, that's the natural way. And and uh, you know all of this hand wringing about immorality and corrupt leadership, you don't solve it by legislation. You solve it by improving the the raw material of public service mm -hmm. and that that's what christian witness and 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 changing lives is all about you would surely hope and expect the the best sort of morality and and, and highest ideals to percolate up into the public office mm -hmm. uh, but you but you don't do it by uh, legislative power i mean we, we, i think if nothing else this current round of uh, uh, firings and, and, and retirements because of uh, one immoral act or another shows that there's too many people placed in high office that have no good sense of morality. Mm. And you're not really solving it by just picking them off like in a shooting gallery because it surely is saying that there's a corruption that's, that's endemic. How do you solve that? You solve it by re-education, to, to take a communist term. You start dealing from the, the, the ground up changing people's attitudes and that will, they will finally re replace the uh, corrupt leadership. I agree uh, with that statement. Uh, certainly uh, to bring about change in society, one has to start at the ground level. And, uh, you know, the Bible even talks about that uh, where Paul had admonished Timothy uh, and believers that read scripture to take the time and study scriptures and in the end of the time that there would be corruption of morals and so Absolutely. forth. Absolutely. And, and, you know, there's a certain irony that uh, a few years ago we discovered that uh, Billy Graham, who's sort of the patron saint of evangelicals, that in his efforts to gain influence and political power, I don't know if you remember, under Freedom of Information, we hear these tapes where in the back room with these political leaders, he's maligning Jews and speaking like the ultimate war hawk. This was unseemly for a minister. Mm -hmm. and, and I think not just the leadership, but the, the uh, Christians will be corrupting their, their own agenda if they uh, seek political power. 
Yeah, certainly uh, society does show us, and history in particular, that any time that religion becomes so closely intertwined with politics, that both actually become corrupt and lose their sense of mission. Jesus was not politically neutral. After all, he's recorded of having said of Herod, he says, that fox. And in that day and age, just to say something like that about the ruler was actually to put your life at threat. But at the same time, when Jesus' life was on the line and he was in chains before Herod on trial as a political pretender, he said to him, I'm not pursuing a political agenda. He says, if I were, he said, my followers would fight for me. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. And I think today in the United States, an ostensibly religious society, but a secular government designed to protect religion, there can be no better protection for people of faith than to keep out of political activity as a religious bloc. Of course, individuals have every right to do so. For Liberty Insider, this is Lincoln Steed.